Good morning. Let's stand and worship together. We're glad you're here this morning, whether you're here in person or watching online. Thank you for joining us. 
If you're new here, uh, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. And the way we can do that is if you would text the word new to the number on the screen, and uh, it'll just ask a couple of questions so that we know how we can best serve you. Or if you want to meet someone in person, uh, in the lobby after the service, uh, there will be one of our staff at the connection point sign, and you can talk with them there. So let's continue to worship together. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am Realized he has
Father God, you are worthy, so worthy, worthy of every song we could ever sing, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. So Lord, right now, as we listen to your word, help us to open our ears and our hearts to really hear what you have to say to us. I know you have something personal to say to each one of us through this message, so wait, may we be open and may we be willing to respond and follow you with what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Good to see everybody uh, here this morning. And uh, glad you're able to venture out, hopefully safely. And I don't know if, about you, but for me, whenever we uh, need to miss a Sunday at church, it just the rest of the week just felt off to me. I'm always like a day off. So I don't know if you had that same experience, but now we can all get back on track and be aligned and go into the week. And uh, hopefully it's uh, going to be a great week for you, especially if we can take the advice from God's Word, especially that, that we started with two weeks ago when we started this series called How to Have the Worst Year Ever. And you might be thinking, well, that's a crazy idea for a sermon series. You know, it, it's, it's really talking about the decisions that we make that might lead us to have not only a bad year, but could, could prove to be disastrous decisions for the rest of our life. And, and so it's, it's not really about, okay, here's what you need to do to have a bad decision. What we want to do is to help you avoid making those decisions. And these are decisions that... Uh, apply to all of us. These are a lot of the decisions that maybe we've already made and we're regretting from them. Uh, we are actually recovering from some of those bad decisions. But we started off this series, and, and, and we could be talking about a lot of different decisions that we could make. But this series, uh, originally the series is only four weeks long, but now it's down to three because we missed that week. We're just going to cover some areas that I think are more broad and general areas that, are, that have a larger impact in our life. And so we started two weeks ago, the very first Sunday of the year, with the decision, the temptation that all of us have, especially as we're starting off a new year, uh, the decision, the temptation we have to do it all. As you're thinking about your to-do list for the year, your agenda, everything you want to accomplish, all the resolutions that we said we're not going to talk about, and we're still not going to talk about resolutions, even though most of us have probably forgotten them you know, by now. We're you know, three weeks into January. But everything that we really feel to make 2024 the best year it can be, the temptation is, is, to, is to just make these to-do lists and, and have all these different plans. And that's okay until it's not. That's okay until everything that we want to do and all the plans and all the to-do lists and the agendas actually become a distraction from what matters most. And this is, and, and the temptation is, is to do it all and is to do it by ourselves because the because in this culture, we actually wear this uh, busyness, this idea that we have to do it all or we can do it. We wear it as a badge of accomplishment. It's it's a good thing if you're busy. It's a good thing if you can get it all done. If you're a get it done person, but we learned from the very the very first week in the story that we looked at, but uh, of Mary and Martha. Remember the story when Jesus comes to. Martha's house, and she does what was culturally appropriate during that time is to make your guest a meal. And I can't think of a more important guest in someone's house than, in, than hosting Jesus. And so she's there, and so she's feeling the cultural pressure to make her house guest, to make Jesus a meal. And she, just, she is going crazy trying to get it all done, and she's irritated that her, sister's just, her sister, who has the right priority, has figured out Jesus is in the house, and so what I need to do is to sit here as he's teaching and take it all in, just absorb everything that he's teaching. And so she had the right priority. And so point coming from that week is all of the busyness, everything that we think we have to do to accomplish something, to be important, to get it all done, if it distracts us from what matters most, then it's going to keep us from growing to be more like Jesus. Because Jesus is not interested in everything that we're doing. Even if we're doing it, and this is the tough part, even if we're doing it for Him, He's not interested in us doing it all. He's interested in who we are becoming. 
So everything that we're doing can actually become a distraction from our devotion to Jesus. And so what I want us to continue to think about is what are we going to do this year that's going to help us avoid the distractions of doing it all so that we don't miss out on being more devoted to Jesus because the worst thing that could happen is at the end of this year is we look back on it where it's like, what happened to our devotion to Jesus? Everything else got in the way. Uh, the most important thing that could happen to all of us this year is that we're looking back on a year where our devotion to Jesus has allowed us to experience the kind of life that God really wants us to have. And so we had an action step for you, and it's still out there. And so if you want to uh, do something proactive and positive to, to ensure uh, that we are more devoted to Jesus at the end of the year than we are right now, uh, consider registering for Rooted, uh, which is a 10-week small group experience that will start on February 20th. So it's coming up pretty quick, and uh, but there's still time and there's still room for you to jump in. And it's on the app or on our website. You can uh, register there. But uh, again, a real concrete way for you to uh, become more devoted to Jesus and avoid the distractions of life. And so with that said, we're going to jump into week two. And again, this is another area that... Uh, I think it's just about as significant in terms of what it means to uh, enhance our relationship with Jesus Christ. And, <clears throat> and here it goes. It comes down to who is in your friend group. Who are the people that you are allowing into your inner circle? Who are the people that you are allowing to be close to your heart, to influence your life, to influence your thought life, to influence your decisions in life? In other words, who are your people? Because the people that you allow to be close to your heart will have an influence on your life, your inner circle of friends. And I didn't make this up, but I think it's a wise statement. You show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Because the people that we surround ourselves with will influence our lives for the good or for the bad. There's an entrepreneur, business person who died several years ago. His name is John Rohn, and he made this statement, and I, I believe it's true. The, state, the statement is, you will be the average of your five closest friends. Your life, my life, will be shaped by the five closest friends that we have around us. Your thought life, your actions uh, are going to be shaped by the people that we are allowing to have influence in our life. And so the question is, how do the closest friends that you have, how they impacted your thinking, how, has, how have you changed since you have been spending time with them? Have they elevated your thought life and your performance or have they diminished them? Have they caused you to have a, a higher moral standard and, 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 and higher values? Or have you been kind of forced to uh, diminish or to think less of your value system or compromise in some way? That's, that's, that's the power of decision. It's the power of the people who are around us. Solomon said like this, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get into trouble. So we have to decide if we have the right kinds of people around us. You surround yourself with the wrong kind of people, and you're going to make the wrong decisions. You're going to take bad advice, and it becomes the reason that we struggle with certain decisions in life. Now, here's my contention is, it really, a lot of the dumb decisions, at least in my life, a lot of the dumb decisions that I've made my share of them, uh, did not really come down to whether or not I understood it to be a good decision or a bad decision. In other words, a dumb decision that I have made in my life really wasn't because the decision was somewhat fuzzy and I didn't know if it was a good decision or a bad decision. It wasn't one of those things where it's kind of like you're on the fence, should I or should I not do this? It was clearly a bad decision and I possibly made the decision, made a bad decision because I listened to the people that I had surrounded myself with. And again, it wasn't the difference between good and bad and me not knowing what good and bad was. It had a lot more to do with my desire to be accepted and to have the approval of the people who, were, who I'd surrounded myself with. 
And, I, and we've all, you know, if you've got kids, you've had this conversation with your kids too. And, and the reason you had the conversation with your kids is because you know you did the same foolish, you know, mistakes. But you've had this, you know, this conversation with your kids where they made a really bad decision and you know and they know it had nothing to do with whether or not there was some confusion about whether it was right or wrong. Because, you, because here's how it would play out in our house. I would be like, in what world did you envision this working out well for you or for anybody else around you? They knew it was a bad decision, just like when I was their age, I knew it was a bad decision, but it was all about peer pressure, approval, and curiosity. That's the power of influence in our life. And so the story that we're going to look at today, and I'm excited about it because I honestly don't think I have ever taught uh, from, from this passage before, but this story has enormous implications for us in terms of our Deci- uh, ability to make good decisions, just as it had enormous implications for God's people going all the way back to the time of Solomon. God's people took bad advice, and this is one of the reasons I love the Bible, because the Bible just like puts it out there, it's real, we get to see the good and the bad, and we get to see people who were God's people make really bad decisions and experienced and suffered the consequences. So this story goes all the way back to the time of Solomon, and he had a son. This is the son that lived. We know that they had another child that died. So this is the son that lived, and his name was Rehoboam. Rehoboam starts with an R, and, and this is the reason, I make, the reason I'm highlighting this is because sometimes Bible stories, especially in the Old Testament, they have names that are difficult to pronounce or to remember. What's even harder is when a Bible story has two different names in it, and they sound alike. And so simple-minded people like me have a hard time sometimes, okay, so, because I'm not like, if I'm watching a movie and there's a lot of different names and people and plots and things like that, it's easy for me to get lost. i got to pay attention. So I'm just encouraging you. As we're moving through this story, just hang with us. I'm going to try to explain this in a way that we can all, you know, hang with the names and understand, you know, who these people are in the story. Solomon's son is Rehoboam. And he was the heir apparent to the throne of Israel. And we all know that Solomon lived a life of extravagance. I mean, we know that story. Solomon was the wisest person that ever lived. And people would come around to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And and God also blessed Solomon with all of the best. And so Solomon not only had the best of everything, Solomon had a hundred of the best of everything. He was just like so incredibly wealthy. So he had everything that a person could possibly ever want, uh, which means that his son probably did too. Now, despite Solomon's wealth and prosperity, it didn't necessarily mean that the rest of Israel, that the rest of God's people also was experiencing that kind of prosperity because somebody had to carry the burden of Solomon's extravagance. And so there were all of these expenses related to the exports for Solomon's you know, work projects and, and you know, the, the temples and the castles and the homes that he was building and, and all these building materials. And so it placed a heavy burden on the people of Israel. And they were hoping that when the, the heir apparent you know, came to the throne, they were hoping that maybe Solomon's son would be able to kind of lighten their load and remove some of this tax burden. Because nobody wanted to continue paying for Solomon's lifestyle. So they were hoping for a change. So look with me if you would. This is in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Remember, this is Rehoboam. This is Solomon's son. Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all Israel had gathered to make him king. When, this is the next guy, when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he returned from Egypt. For he had fled to Egypt to escape from King Solomon. So the leaders of Israel summoned him and Jeroboam, and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us, and then we will be your loyal subjects. So Rehoboam replied, give me three days to think this over, and then come back for my answer. So the people Went away. Okay, so fair enough. Uh, Rehoboam's like, hey, give me some time to think about this. So remember, Rehoboam is the king's son. Everybody, you know, cool with that? All right. Jeroboam was the king's rival. But the people felt, uh, and, and this is probably accurate, the people felt that they needed a voice, and you're probably not going to get a voice if you're speaking to the king's son. 
Okay, because he's going to be stuck on where he is in life, and he's going to want everything that his father had and probably more. So they're, they're probably thinking, we're not going to get a lot accomplished if we're going to talk just to Rehoboam. So we're going to talk with Jeroboam. Jeroboam's going to be our voice in this. So go to, the, go to the king now, Rehoboam, and see if he will just like lighten our low, like give us a break on the taxes, okay? In return, we will be loyal. We will reciprocate that, that, that kindness we will be your loyal servants. You're not going to have to worry about anything from us. It's going to be a win-win situation, uh, situation. So Rehoboam, being the king's son, doesn't need any more money. He's got everything that he could possibly ever need. Why? Because he's a royal. Okay? Just think the crown. That, this is just kind of the, the situation as it was. He doesn't really need anything else. He doesn't really need all those taxes. But uh, he's, 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 he's kind of listening to this thought. Okay, maybe I can endear myself to these people, lighten their tax load, and this could have been his legacy. He could have went down, he had the opportunity to be this great king, popular, well-loved by the people. And, and, I, and I'm not sure if this has anything to do with the fact that Jeroboam is standing right there, and Rehoboam is looking at him thinking like, I have to make a point that I am the king's son, and I'm large and in charge, and you're not. So he makes this, he makes this smart move initially. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take three days and, and, and think about this. And so what he does is he, he wants to go and he wants to talk to some of his father's advisors. Okay, so you can't fall in there. That's, that's a good move. So look at verse, uh, verse 6. Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had counseled his father. So these might have been like maybe the boomers of that generation. What is your advice, he asked. <clears throat> How should I answer these people? And the older counselors replied, If you are willing to be a servant of these people today and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. And so he goes to these people who are, uh, they have more life experience. We'll just say it that way. And he's like, How should I handle this situation? And, and they tell him. These are older men. They have served with uh, Solomon. They, they probably saw how the heavy tax burden was affecting the people. And they affirm what the people say. It's like, listen, if you just cut these people a break, you're going to be able to have this, this great reign and, and loyal people. And you're going to go down to history as this wonderful king because you're going to endear yourself to them. So that's, that's, his, that's their advice to him. It's great advice, but great advice is only great advice if you listen to the advice. And so he goes to the younger group. He wants a second opinion. So verse 8. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men. That's going to be a really important point later. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the younger men who had, he had grown up with. And they were now his advisors. What is your advice, he asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? Before he hears the advice of this younger group, he's already set aside and rejected the wisdom of these older counselors in favor of whatever this younger group, okay, so maybe this is Generation X, maybe this is Generation Z or Millennials or whoever, this younger group of people are going to give to them. So it's almost like he's, he's pre-decided what he's going to do. He's just looking for somebody to agree with him, okay, which is a lot of times that's, that's how it goes. And so he goes and he, and he talks to them. <clears throat> this is what they said. The young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want to a, li a, a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. And yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, and now I will beat you with scorpions. Rehoboam surrounded himself with inexperienced, selfishly motivated friends who influenced him to make a really bad decision. And it affected not just him, it affected all of Israel. In fact, it was one of the, uh, one of the factors that led to the split of the kingdom. He is motivated, and, he, and, 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 he's motiva and he's, his motive is the fact that he wants to impress his friend. I'm sure he probably knew what the right answer was. He wanted acceptance and approval and be able to impress his friends. 
and his five closest friends let him down. And all this does is it underscores the need for you and I. And, and, and it doesn't matter. I'm not speaking to like younger people or younger generations. This is true of any, any age. Underscores the need to surround ourselves with the right kind of people with the right voices. And so if you just take this year and you want to avoid having the worst year ever, probably one of the most important decisions that you could make aside from making sure that we're not distracted by a to-do list, is to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with the right people. Who is in your inner circle? Who is going to care for you? Who is going to challenge you to do the right thing? Who is going to influence your thoughts and look out for you and to walk with you? And it's your call. It Really, it's our call in this. And the harsh reality is the fact that if we make a bad decision, and that bad decision was influenced because we surrounded ourselves with the wrong people. We cannot blame the wrong people. That was our call to make who we surround ourselves with. That decision is on us, and we have to own it. And the reason it's so important is we owe it to ourselves. You owe it to the people who rely on you to make good decisions. And this becomes the difference between you know, a thoughtful life, a life that can benefit and bless others, or a life that's really just about selfish ambition, about everything that we really want to do in life. And so if you're spending time with the wrong crowd, you're going to go the wrong direction. And so one of, the, one of the most significant things you could do, change your crowd and you'll change your life. Because God wants you to have a good, purpose-filled, prosperous life. Now pro- by prosperous, I don't mean money. By prosperous, I mean blessed in the way that God wants you to experience meaning and purpose and have a satisfying life which has absolutely nothing to do with wealth and money. But we can have a prosperous life if we're living the life that God wants us to live. And a lot and, and that means we'll be living for something bigger than ourselves. Rehoboam was just living for himself. So ask yourself, in your environments, in your inner circle, in your circle of friends, okay, what are you being asked to do? If, if, if you're not being inspired to follow Jesus, to go in God's direction, it, you need to take time to make a change. And so quietly critique your inner circle. And you're not judging them as much as you are making a judgment call about who you are going to allow into your life. And I would encourage you to create distance from certain people in your life. I would encourage you to create distance from complainers, okay? I don't really spend a lot of time on the, uh, any kind of a community forum. Uh, I know there's some, probably some value and benefit there. I don't like to spend time. I don't, I mean, as, far, as far as social media, um, I don't even care if you're in my own family. If you're complaining and whining and griping about everything, you're out. I'm not following you. I don't want that as part of my life. Distance yourself from complainers. Distance yourself from, from cynics. Distance yourself from critical people. But because before you know it, stuff rubs off. And you'll become just like them. The wrong people in your inner circle is what you're going to find yourself doing at some point in time. Are they bringing out the worst in you? Are they causing you to compromise your values? Are they pitting you against God? Are they pitting you against other people? And, and some people might think that the right voice, the, the voice that I really want and need in my life, are people that always agree with you. Now that's, that's nothing to be further from the truth there. And again, this goes back to when Rehoboam, as soon as he heard the advice of the, of, the, of the older generation that was trying to give him good advice, he rejected it even before he heard the advice of the younger crowd. Why? He predecided. He already knew what he was going to do. He was just looking for people that will come and affirm the decision that he had already made in his life. He knew what he was looking for. So understand this. Understand this. The wrong people will always affirm our ego, our selfishness, our self-pity, and our sin. Please hear me in this. The wrong people will always affirm our selfishness, our ego, our sin, our self-pity. The, the worst parts of our character 
you'll find people that will agree and say, yes, this is what you need to do, or this is how you need to feel. Sometimes we need to have people in our lives that will challenge us and call us out to go in a different direction. And so we spend a lot of time talking about the wrong kind of people in our life. Well, who should we surround ourselves with? Who are the right people and the right voices? And I think you, you really, you know, we should think about how can we surround ourselves with creative people? People who will help us think outside the box. People who will have a vision of you know, what life could be if we made a different decision. Smart people. Uh, don't be intimidated by smart people. I remember John Maxwell has, has said this uh, on several occasions. If you are always the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And you're in the wrong room because you're intimidated, but somebody else might be smarter than you. One of my uh, leadership goals is I always try to find people who are more intelligent than I am and who can push us in a different direction, who can push me and challenge me uh, in different ways. So surround yourself with creative, smart people. Secondly, surround yourself with caring people, people who are going to care about you and they're going to care about others. And you could just tell if you're around a caring person. A caring person will stand by you through thick and thin. If you're, just, if, if you're just looking for any old person and any, any old person is going to do, then you might fr- find a friend. It's, it's the kind of friend that, uh, if you remember the story in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, when he went out, we had all kinds of friends when he had money. But when the money dried up and he was on his own, his friends were gone. And I'm guessing Rehoboam, if the story plays out the way I think it does, Rehoboam, those, those friends who were only interested in riding his coattails to the top and getting a share of everything that he was going to share. Times turn bad, they're gone. So you want to surround yourself with people who will be there when things are going your way and who will be there to support you when the bottom falls out. Those are the friends that we need in our life. And third, obviously, why don't don't we surround ourselves with Christ-like people, people who love Jesus? Why cannot that be the baseline test? And let's be honest, uh, we're going to have people in our lives who don't love Jesus, and you can still be friends with them. In fact, you should be friends with them. But what we have to decide is how close are we going to allow them to get, how much influence are we going to allow them to have in our life. And so just make sure if you have non-Christian friends, and again, we should have friends that are you know, outside of the community of Christ. We just need to make sure that we have enough Christ-like friends in our life that their influence and our, their voice in our life is going to uh, offset any other bad advice that we might get. And this carries over to the New Testament. When the Apostle Paul was speaking to a church that was going through all kinds of issues, I can't think of a church that had more issues than the Corinthian church. And he was writing to the Corinthian church. He was trying to convince them of the importance of believing in the, uh, in the resurrection of Jesus because they were being influenced by people that didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. People that didn't believe that Jesus you know, had risen from the, from the dead. And that decision, that, 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 that worldview was affecting the way that they were living because they had no investment in the, in the afterlife. They had no investment in eternity. And so they had no other hope other than the present world. And so if you have no other hope other than the present world, why not live like a hedonist? And so Paul is writing to this group of, of uh, Christians in this church, and he says this. He says, don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. In other words, if you have the wrong view of Jesus, we will, have the, we will make the wrong choices in life because it's all where we want to place the emphasis. And this is a church where some of them were being influenced with the wrong view of Jesus. It was coming out, it was showing up in the way that they lived. If they love Jesus... They will think right and they will do right. This is why we surround ourselves with Christ-like friends. If they have the right view of Jesus, they will think right and they will do right. So be around Christ-like people. Be around people who celebrate 
love and truth and holiness. Listen to what Paul says in just a few, couple of chapters before that. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 6 and 7. He's talking about love. He says, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Wouldn't it be awesome to have a friend who is defined by these qualities to surround ourselves with people that will demonstrate this kind of character in our life? True friends, true friends will call us out when our life is going off track in our relationship with Jesus. So who's in your inner circle? And I'm speaking to young, and I'm speaking to not so young. I'm speaking to boomers, speaking to Gen X, millennials, Gen Z. Doesn't matter what your age. Who is in your inner circle? Do you have a friend that you can count on? A way to think about friends is this. If we have children, would we want our children to grow up and be like the friends that we have in our life? And if the answer is no, then it's time to make a change. Would you want your children that you're raising to grow up and to be like the friends that you have? Be honest. If the answer is no, it's time to make a change to avoid having the worst year ever. And one final challenge. Maybe one of the best ways to really process this is to think about being the kind of friend a friend would want to have. Look at Proverbs 12, 26. The godly give good advice to their friends. The wicked lead them astray. Be a friend a friend would like to have. Be the one who will help others around you think big. Be the one who will care for others during good times and bad times. Be the one who will celebrate others, who will celebrate when they make good decisions and in humility and gentleness and kindness be able to call others out and to give good advice to their friends to help them avoid having the worst year ever. The good and the godly give good advice to their friends. So are you growing or not? It's going to have a lot to do with who we surround ourselves with. And the stakes are way too high. There's too much at stake to let bad company ruin our chance at a good and godly life. So have the courage to critique your inner circle in such a way that you know you're going to be listening to the right voices and you're going to have the right kind of influence so that you can make the right decisions and you can have a blessed life, a prosperous life, a purposeful life, a satisfying life that goes way beyond just this year. It's all about who is in your inner circle. Here in just a couple minutes, we're going to share in a time together and this is important as we share. We call this time communion. And the reason that it's important, the reason it relates to what we're talking about today is in Scripture, you are, we, uh, the body of Christ is instructed to take this together, which reinforces the idea of community. Which means if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, you don't do this on your own. We do this together. We love and support and share with one another, the good times and the bad times. And the reason that we do this together, first of all, Jesus asked us to do it because he knew we would need to do this. But it reinforces this idea that we're all in this together. We all need the grace of God together. We all need to strengthen one another together. We share life. We do life together. And the strongest bonds that we have will be the bond of the blood of Jesus as we come around his table and remind us that he has made us a part of this community so that we can share our struggles with one another and we can be stronger together and we can show the world something else, something worth having. So when it's right for you, after I pray, go ahead and take the bread which reminds us of the broken body of Jesus that he willingly offered for us. And then we'll share the juice together, the juice that reminds us of his blood that
cleanses us from all of our sin. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We come together as one community, as one body. And Father, I pray that as people come to know you, that, that they will be able to find their inner circle, just like your son had his inner circle. And he poured himself into them. And they were there for one another. To be that example as we find community in the body of Christ. And hopefully we can have a group of friends who will be with us through thick and thin. And that group of friends hopefully will always remind us of the thickness of the bond that we have in Christ. As a bond that was formed by the blood that he shed on the cross. So, Father, we come around this table because you've invited us, um, because you've said that you want to share this meal with us uh, one day in heaven, and we look forward to that. We thank you for the life that you have um, given us to live, and we pray you'd help us to make the most of it. In Jesus' name. share the cup together. So if you came this morning uh, prepared to give um, all of the usual ways of, of doing that are, are available through the app or online or the plates in the back. Uh, on behalf of leadership, staff, uh, thank you for your generosity, and uh, we're just really looking forward to uh, another year where hopefully we can be a blessing uh, to our community um, through your generosity. So uh, for whatever uh, you're prepared, thank you for that, and uh, that's a way that we continue in our worship and a way that we express our trust and devotion uh, to Christ and his cause. Would you stand and sing with us?
Help us to live our lives, to be good friends to others, and point them to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go in peace.